Ralph Nader was talking about the um, uh, the violence against the protesters. He was like, first, the police departments in other cities will be observing the nature and the reaction of mass arrests in places like Denver, Chicago, and Atlanta. They're studying it. They've already had a mayor's convention. So the mayors are in coordination with each other to quash these um, uh, dissenters. The camping ban in Louisville is nearly identical to the Denver camping ban that had happened. So uh, people are watching Denver, Chicago, and Atlanta. So Denver, Chicago, and Atlanta. The plutocrats' first response is always to push police power against the people. That's the plutocrats' first response. That's what Mayor Fisher first wanted to do. You could just tell he had, you know, he was foaming at the mouth. He just had a bloodlust against the 99%. The recidivist violations of the ruling class are rarely pursued, yet the rumbles of the lower class are often stifled with the onset of colder weather and looming police pressure. The protesters need new venues for their demonstrations. Activists need to vary their tactics. I suggest citizens surround the local offices of their senators and representatives. Uh, so put pressure on the, you know, the people in power, senators, representatives, a number of Americans fed up with a gridlocked Congress beset by Craven or Cowardly, both marinated in corporate campaign cash, can motivate an endless pool of activists who want their voices to be heard. Occupy London is surrounded by a Christian prayer group for protection, which was beautiful, having a Christian prayer group. Um, hold hands and they're protecting uh, I want to say they're protecting the Muslims so Occupy U of L you should get the Christians out there with you the Christians um, Paulo Freire says that his pedagogy was directly for Christians so uh, Christians should understand uh, uh, freedom and not bowing down to the Roman Emperor and being free to choose your own beliefs and ideas. Do not bow down to the Roman Emperor. You are your own person. So that's something Christians believe in. Uh, the poor, they're, they're for the poor. Um, at least the Christians who follow Jesus Christ. There's some uh, a lot of Christians who uh, don't pay attention to Jesus Christ at all. And there's a lot of a assholes. A lot of Christians are total fucking assholes. Um, and I think it's because they don't listen to Jesus or Mary, and they just say, I'm a Christian, what you going to do about it, punk? And it's like, <laughs> I ain't going to do anything about it. That's your choice. You can, you know, uh, be who you want to be. So, uh, I think we need to expand. Uh, I've already mentioned that. We already got a home thing, so that's different. There's lots of colleges in Kentucky, so other Occupy movements. Lexington, Occupy Lexington, Occupy Covington, Occupy Newport, Occupy Bellevue. Occupy Paducah, Occupy West Liberty, Occupy Pikeville, Occupy Hodgenville, you know, Occupy Anchorage, Occupy Richmond, Occupy Union, Occupy Warsaw, there could be Occupy everywhere, Occupy Gent, Occupy Gent, motherfuckers. <laughs> Egyptian Day of Rage and the Daily Protest Lessons. The Egyptian Day of Rage begins on January 25th. So, the Day of Rage was their Day of Revolution, January 25th. So, Day of Rage. Okay, January 26th is the timeline of the Egyptian Revolution. So, uh, it might be a little dry, but I think it's fascinating. So, timeline. January 25th, Revolution. January 26th, 2011. They shut down the Internet and the mobile services. This is in Egypt. After several Facebook groups were created and tweets from Twitter called for mass demonstrations, the Egyptian government shut down Internet access for most of the country. This was done to cripple one of the protesters' main organizational tools and to impede the flow of news and people. January 28, 2011, the Friday, Friday of Anger protests began. Hundreds of thousands demonstrated in Cairo and other Egyptian cities after Friday prayers. Opposition leader Mohammed El Baradai, uh, Baradai El Baradai arrived in Cairo. The reports of looting prisons were opened and burned down, allegedly on orders of, from then Minister of the Interior, Habib El Adli. Prison inmates escaped in mass in what was believed to be an attempt to terrorize protesters. Police forces were withdrawn from the streets and the military was deployed. International fears of violence grew, but no major casualties were reported. President Hosni Mubarak made his first address to the nation and pledged to form a new government. Later that night, clashes broke out in Tahir Square between revolutionaries and pro-Mubarak demonstrators, leading to the injury of several and the death of more. 
So fucking Mubarak started killing the people. You start killing the people, that's when the, it's over. Game over, Mayor Fisher. You, you kill one of us, you're fucked. You're done. You'll be done in Louisville. You'll be run out just like uh, the guy who killed uh, uh, William Justice Goble. You'll be run out just like the Protestants ran the Germans out. In 1855, you'll be ran out. You won't be welcome here in Louisville. One of us dies by you, one of your fucking orders. Fuck you, motherfucker. You want to kill us? Fuck you. If you do it. If not, then it's a conditional fuck you. So if not, then, you know, may peace be unto you and your family. Uh, but if some bullshit goes down, fuck you. So the military reportedly refused to follow, let's see, January 29th, 2011, four days after the revolution. The military presence in Cairo increased. A curfew was declared but was widely ignored as the flow of deviant protesters to Tahir Square continued throughout the night. The military reportedly refused to follow orders to fire live ammunition and exercise restraint overall. There are no reports of major casualties. So the Egyptian Revolution and the Velvet Revolution, too peaceful, overall relatively peaceful. They did not violently overthrow the government. They had massive peaceful protests. Um, there were deaths that happened in Egypt, significant deaths, over a thousand, like 1,500 deaths uh, happened in Egypt. But that's because of government repression and because of the violence of Mubarak's men, of uh, the, the state's guns. The police have got to see that they are the 99%. They work day to day. They are to protect us, okay? Yeah, follow the law. Yeah, the politicians pass the laws, but they don't tell you what to do. They don't make orders and say, you must do this. If they want to give you orders, they pass a new law. You're the bosses. Look at the military. It will be the police and the military that takes over when Kentucky has a revolution. When Kentucky has a revolution, who's going to declare martial law? Who will take this state over? Or will they join forces in tandem against the people? Now, I think one of them has got to be for the people. And since the police are out there every day, you know, arresting people and beating people up, they already have a biased perspective. But the military... They've defended us going overseas in foreign countries. National Guard came out to our houses to make sure that we had electric. So the National Guard, a lot of times during the civil rights, during the watch riots, and during a lot of civil rights, it was the National Guard that would come in and protect the people from the police. They would stop the police riots. And just like in, in Egypt, the military came in and took over. And if the military cedes power to uh, President Morsi, if the military does this, if SCAF actually, you know, does what they should do in a democracy, since that's what the whole fucking revolution was about, and back off and become uh, subordinate and obedient to a civilian government, then the revolution will be 100% complete. Um, and they will be celebrated. The military will be celebrated for stepping in, making sure democracy uh, was established as rule, uh, as law and order was established. The military will be remembered for that in Egypt. So February 1st, 2011, uh, seven days after the revolution in Egypt, Mubarak made another televised address and offered several concessions. He pledged to not run for another term in the elections planned for September and pledged political reforms. He stated that he would stay in office to oversee a peaceful transition. Small but violent clashes began that night between pro-Mubarak and anti-Mubarak groups. February 2nd, 2011, Battle of the Camel. Okay, Battle of the Camel. February 2nd, 2011, eight days after the revolution. Violence escalated as waves of Mubarak supporters met anti-government protesters and some of Mubarak supporters rode on camels and horses in the Tahir Square, reportedly welding swords and sticks. President Mubarak reiterated his refusal to step down in interviews with several news agencies. Incidents of violence towards journalists and reporters escalated amid speculation that violence was being encouraged by Mubarak as a way to bring the protest to an end. Look at Assad. Look at Yemen. Look at what they're doing in Syria. That's all they're doing is they're justifying their violence with state-sponsored violence. It's a fucking bloodshed in Syria. It's a fucking bloodshed. It's fucking bullshit. I don't give a fuck who's responsible for it. It needs to get fixed. Kofi Annan has now stepped down. There's no United Nations leader now. The United Nations is, is, is worthless. It's totally bunk. It's, there's nothing there. They're going to have to have an election to figure out their leader now. And he's stepping down because they're not doing shit about Syria. Plus Yemen. Oh, my God. There's full shit that's happening in Yemen. 
what's America doing in Yemen? Are we actually bombing the people that need to be bombed, or are we bombing, you know, the good people, like we did in Central America, like we do so many times? I, I don't know. I, I, uh, I, that, there's so many questions. The, the military is not transparent. They say we're in war, so you can't tell them the truth and shit. So you get so much power away. The War Powers Act, the War Powers Clause, Obama's got the NDAA. When they're at war, a war president has dictatorial powers. They can do as the fuck they please. And that's bullshit. Because how do we know what they're doing? We don't know what they're doing. I, the empire doesn't benefit me because we're spending way too much money on military and war and casualties and killing people. Um, but also because we're killing innocent people. We're creating more terrorists. Why did we kill one million people in Iraq? What the fuck did Iraq have to do in 9-11? Not a goddamn thing, America. You fucked up. America, you fucked up big time. Not just in 2000, but 2004. And now we're going to keep on fucking up forever? We're going to be an empire? Is that what we decided because fucking Bush lied our, um, lied us into war? I mean, that's what gall, what gall for Bush. Good for you. You were able to tell, show us that you could use propaganda system in order to achieve your ends. You're straight up a war criminal. You're a war criminal. And since you're a war criminal, you know, then then that, that means, you know, you your actions are illegitimate. You, we cannot have an empire. The empire does not benefit the working class. The empire does not help me, especially when we're killing innocent people and creating more terrorists. Central America, uh, uh, Allende, Salvador Allende in Chile. I know. Uh, Oscar Romero. I know about this stuff. I know about this shit. Sandinistas. Ronald Reagan, Iran Contra, Iran Contra, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan's the one who get Bin Laden his weapons. Ronald Reagan was the one that dropped Lebanese troops, uh, Marines in the Lebanon, blowing up women and children. One of the examples that Bin Laden used to justify his terrorist atrocities. Bin Laden says, well, since Ronald Reagan killed us, how come we uh, aren't allowed to kill you? Isn't that what you're supposed to do for self-defense? Aren't we allowed to kill you back? And yes. Yes, if a person, if we're responsible, our government is responsible for murdering us, they are justified in their retaliation. Um, in, in eye for an eye type justice, an eye for an eye. And it's surprising that with the amount of people and bloodshed that America has caused uh, throughout the world that there hasn't been more 9-11 attacks. And another terrorist attack would only benefit the empire and the war party. So, you know, great that the world, con the world is not invading America. That's good. Great for you all. Well, hopefully Americans realize the amount of mercy that Americans are being uh, allowed. Because the Palestinians, the way the Palestinians are being killed, the way the Syrians are being killed, the way the Afghani people are being killed, Pakistan babies are being killed by drone strikes. This is bad. We need to, you know, we need to bring the war home. Uh, we need to, people need to know that this is a real war going on. The Vietnam War uh, uh, was largely influenced by the media. You saw those images on TV, but people here in this country, we don't see a war. We go through our day, there's no war happening in America. What war? There's no war here. There's no war in this country. So since we don't have to worry about it, we don't. And that's why I think it's up to protesters, uh, occupiers, activists to remind the people that we are still in a war and to protest and to stand up against the war. We've got to stop this war. Uh, not to mention the war, anti-war movement is what spearheaded all the other movements. The anti-war movement, you know, and we need revolution because of uh, uh, that's the only way social movements will actually become successful. You'll never figure out, you know, um, social movements right on the backs of a revolution. That's Emma Goldman. So, yeah, so in the fucking war, in the empire wars, in the class wars, in the drug wars, let's end the war against people. Let's end the war against the 99%. Let's end the, oppress, uh, the oppression that we're getting here. They want to say, Noam Chomsky wants to say we're not fascists. I, sorry, Chomsky, you got more privileged existence than me because I think I run into a police officer out here and, yeah, I got a right to a lawyer and a trial and all that bullshit, but I know how the system works. And just like that judge said when it was reprimanded, the U of L cop, who wasn't showing her respect. We're all on the same team here. We're all on the same team. The judge, the prosecutor, and the cops are on the same side. And we have a public pretender, and it's just to go through the process. So when a cop shakes you down and arrests you, that's it. You're, that's over. And that's why we live in a police state. 
uh, when we actually have public, not public pretenders, we actually have real representation. We have real trials and real people who understand the system and real jury trials uh, since we are obligated to a jury, tri jury trial. That's the only way we're going to get better when we start actually, I guess, understanding the system better. Um, that's something that Lowndes County did. Uh, Black Panthers in Lowndes County, they had artistic drawings of how the system works. And I think that's a good idea for Louisville, too. So, revolution, viva la revolution, occupy Louisville.